Hi, everyone. Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you today with another episode of Clyde. Oh, <laughs> no, we're not doing a podcast today. We're doing a, Ask Dr. Adriana today. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk with you all today about trauma. Um, trauma has really been a hot topic, I think, in the last few years on a larger scale with social media, with the news. Um, we have a lot of <laughs> traumatic events that are happening in the world right now, um, especially in this last couple of years with the pandemic. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what my experience with trauma is as far as working as a psychologist and particularly an addiction and trauma specialist. And just say a little bit about um, what the tools that I have found helpful for working with trauma um, that I think uh, are the most powerful as someone who has been in this field for over 25 years, you know, I, I'm kind of a lifelong student. I'm always learning new modalities, um, going deeper with the ones that I already know. And so I feel like I've had a lot of experience in learning what tools seem to be the most effective at um, reducing the after effects of trauma. So what, let's start with, you know, what exactly is trauma? Um, you know, when we look at the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, this big fat book that those of us in the mental health field use as a reference guide, um, you know, the basic definition according to the DSM is that trauma is about really witnessing or experiencing a threatened death, physical or sexual violence or injury. Um, and that's kind of a narrow definition I think the trauma really does fall more into the category of um, like what we might call big T traumas of which those are um, and little t traumas, which are the experiences that feel overwhelming to us, um, may create really intense fear or horror or shame or pain or a feeling of lack of control or helplessness. It basically is something that overwhelms our ability to cope in the moment. And so what happens is, um, you know, how we experience that trauma and everybody's really different on this. Um, for example, you know, 10 of us might experience the same traumatic event, let's say a fire, and we could have 10 completely different reactions to it. Some people might bounce back really relatively quickly and without much lingering after effects. And other people might be um, severely impacted by that experience, maybe to the point where they're finding it hard to function. Um, they might be having panic attacks. They might be having flashbacks or nightmares about the experience. Um, they may find themselves uh, feeling more numb or kind of cut off from their emotions, um, just sort of shut down. And, it, and, and this really, you know, has to do somewhat with the fight, flight, freeze response, which I'll say more about. But it's all about like the the resilience that you already have and also the meaning and significance you give to the experience. There's a great quote here from Dr. Gabor Mate, who's also an addiction and trauma specialist. Um, and trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happened to you. So in other words, it, again, it's the meaning we make of it. It's the power we give it, it's the impact we allow it to have on us. And when trauma occurs, particularly at an early age, like childhood trauma, um, that really has pretty significant lasting impacts. You know, I often refer clients to this TED Talk that I think is really helpful. It's on YouTube and you can find it also on the, on the TED Talks website uh, by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who used to be the uh, Surgeon General here in the state of California. And when she was actually a resident in medical school, she did, uh, she worked at a clinic here in San Francisco in uh, Hunters Point Bayview, which is a more impoverished part of town. And she kept seeing all these kids in the clinic who were being diagnosed with ADHD. And she thought that was really strange that all these kids had that particular diagnosis. So she dug a little deeper and she gathered more history on these kids. She found that all, almost all of them were experiencing or had experienced significant trauma in their home. 
And this is, you know, and then she goes on to talk about the adverse childhood experiences uh, study, which I've spoken about before on, on some of these broadcasts, but basically um, the ACEs study was done here in Northern California on about 17,000 patients at Kaiser Permanente Medical, you know, that's the hospital and where you can get uh, insurance and healthcare from. And they looked at, they correlated with these folks in the Kaiser system. They're, they have them go through this checklist of 10 early life experiences and then looked at their health later in life as a result. So the things that were on the quiz were things like, um, did you grow up in a home where there was abuse or neglect? Um, were you personally, physically, emotionally, sexually abused? Um, was there domestic violence in the home? Did you grow up with a parent or someone else in the home who had an addiction or a mental health issue or somebody who went to jail or prison, things like that. And then you would tally up the score based on how many of those 10 experiences you'd have. And then they would look at uh, health issues later in life, like your physical health, heart disease, cancer, lung disease, all these things, mental health things, addiction, um, suicidality, depression, self-harm, things like that. And they found this huge correlation between having had an adverse childhood experience, which we would call potentially a trauma, and having health problems later in life, particularly mental health ones. And they also found that the more experiences you would have, the higher your ACEs score, the more likely you were to have severe health and mental health issues. And so, you know, what they looked at, and now, especially now that we have um, the ability to look at the brain with brain scans, MRIs, and CAT scans, and things like that, we now, and we can do brain waves, EEGs, and things like that, we can actually see the impact that something like trauma has on the brain. Um, so, you know, some of you may know that uh, what typically happens when something unexpected, let's say an accident, uh, a natural disaster, uh, some sort of abuse or violence, when something like that happens, your nervous system will activate. Basically what happens is the information comes in, right? Like let's say you see a fire like coming towards you, uh, your brain will start to do a bunch of things. And so the, in the sensory input comes in through, through your thalamus and gets routed to your amygdala. The amygdala is the emo emotional center of your brain. The fight, flight, freeze response is engaged. This is a survival mechanism. All of us animals have it. Um, you're basically, uh, your body is preparing to either fight, whatever the perceived threat is, flee, flight, which would be run away, or freeze, which is the most primitive response, where it's shut down and hope that, let's say, if you were being chased by a predator, you know, that if you play dead, the predator will leave you alone. So if the fire is coming towards you, your amygdala is firing and saying, danger, danger. So the blood flow will come out of, you know, 70% goes out of your prefrontal cortex, your logical thinking part of your brain. The amygdala is really part of the more primitive parts of your brain. It's the reptilian and mammalian brain that's really active in this fight, flight, freeze response. And uh, the blood flow will go from your internal organs out to your externals, so your hands and feet, so that you can run or you can fight or do whatever you need to do to survive, right? So that's often what will happen with a standard um, fight, flight, freeze response to a traumatic experience. But what happens is, and tying it back to the childhood experiences, if this activation is happening over and over and over again, your amygdala starts getting like trigger happy. You know, it starts responding to things in that same fight, flight, freeze way when it's not actually a life-threatening situation. So if, for example, you grow up in a home with violence and dad is always yelling and screaming and sometimes he's violent, throwing things or hitting people, then every time he raises his voice, you might go into as a kid that full blown kind of fight, flight or freeze shutdown response, right? And so then you're, even though he might not be violent in that moment, it's just his tone of voice or looking at you a certain way. And then people will carry this into adulthood if they don't um, have the resilience to overcome that kind of trauma or carry it into adulthood and it'll start impacting them in all kinds of ways. Um, maybe 
they, uh, again, respond to a certain tone of voice or a look or someone that has a similar posture as that um, abuser perhaps did. Or maybe um, they're going to be stuck in that kind of fight or flight response where they're always in the state of hyper arousal, right? That's one of the symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is this hyper arousal. You're always on edge. You're feeling keyed up. Um, you have a lot of anxiety, maybe even full-blown panic attacks um, that maybe you're connected to a specific thing or maybe you're just kind of happening at random. You might have experiences like nightmares or flashbacks. Um, you might have uh, hypervigilance, which is kind of this like always being on guard, waiting for the other shoe to drop, kind of seeing danger everywhere where there really might not be any. Um, an exaggerated startle response, which is, you know, where you like someone comes up and says, hi, you're jumping 10 feet in the air. Um, these are all, you know, common symptoms of PTSD. And then you also have the, that sort of, so that's being more stuck in the fight or flight aspect. If you're, if you're stuck in freeze, which is really the shutdown, um, everything starts to shut down. Um, you might feel numb or dissociated from your body You feel like you're not even present in your body. Um, you might have a sense of, uh, just numbing and, and, and like, you can't get close to people. Um, maybe, uh, there's problems with sleep. Maybe there's problems with, you know, people will find all these like brilliant strategies to cope with trauma because, um, they, can, they feel like they can't. So they might turn to drugs and alcohol or food or some sort of addictive behavior, um, they may cut themselves off socially and feel disconnected from friends and family. Um, they may develop symptoms of depression. Um, you often see a lot of overlap between uh, people with a history of trauma, people who also may have full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder and, and depression or anxiety or addiction or another mental health diagnosis because um, it really disrupts you not just physically, biochemically, right? Alters the way your brain's functioning and the way your brain chemistry is functioning, but also affects you mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, disconnecting from your authentic self, um, you know, putting on a persona of like tough guy, you know, a lot of bullies actually have been bullied themselves, right? <clears throat> a lot of people who are perpetrators, we know this from uh, research that's been done on, on prisoners. A lot of people who are convicted of violent crimes were once, you know, the victims of violent crimes, things like that. So people are walking around <clears throat> with this unresolved trauma. It does get stuck in your body. Uh, when I was a massage therapist, you know, sometimes I would touch people's bodies in a certain part and they would start crying because they were holding some uh, energy of that traumatic experience in their bodies. Mm. Trauma really can impact how you see yourself. It can impact your sense of self, your self-esteem. Many people, I write about this in my book, uh, what if you're not as fucked up as you think you are, because, and how we come to believe lies about ourselves and what we can do to change them is the subtitle. And in the book, I have a whole chapter devoted to trauma because it is so impactful, not just in the short term, but can often be long-term effects, like what I've talked about. And what we wanna do is we want to be able to, when we're working with trauma, have people, because some of the experts in trauma, like Besser van der Kolk and Peter Levine, you know, they, they say that basically what we do with all these event experiences and emotions and the overwhelm of a traumatic event that we can't deal with in the moment. It's like we repress it. We shove it away in this like trauma capsule and we try to forget about it. Right. And that's why we might also use different techniques to kind of, you know, repress that, like numbing ourselves with drugs. Um, and then what happens is that trauma capsule is still there and it's still impacting you. Right. And the beliefs that come from those traumatic experiences, along with that tra traumatic energy that's still locked up in your body, might be in parts of your brain. Um, this is what really leads to, over time, people starting to potentially decompensate. What I see with people who have unresolved trauma is that over the course of their life, things get tend to get progressively worse for them. It may be uh, health issues come up. I know for me with my Lyme disease, there was definitely a piece of unresolved trauma related to that that was making it difficult for my body 
to fight off these, you know, pathogens that I had been infected with. And once I was able to do some work around those early life experiences that I had had that impacted my health, my body got stronger and I, it was more able to fight off and use the other, you know, healing modalities I was using to heal from the Lyme disease. So it's really important that we not leave unresolved trauma un unresolved. You know, a lot of people will say, well, it's the past, get over it, but it lingers. It's still with you. And what I also find is that when people experience something new, like a new trauma, let's say um, someone unexpectedly passed away, then oftentimes what that does is that opens up that trauma capsule again and brings up all of the old unresolved stuff that you didn't even know was there, that maybe you didn't even know was still impacting you. So really what we want to do, um, oh, and then let me just say one more thing about the beliefs. So when you have had an experience that you, ex you perceive to be traumatic, maybe something was done to you against your will, maybe you didn't have the ability to fight fight off somebody who was attacking you or something like that, you might come to believe some negative things about yourself. You might think things like it was my fault that it happened. Um, I shouldn't have, you know, I think a lot of women feel this way if they are like sexually assaulted when they've gone out, maybe they've been drinking, uh, maybe they blacked out and they don't remember. And so they may blame themselves for that. It's my fault that this happened or, um, they may think that I deserved it, or maybe, um, you know, they come out of it thinking I'm powerless or helpless, or I have no control over the things that happened to me, which we would call a victim consciousness that often comes as a result of trauma. And then, and if you continue to see the world through that lens, you know, the likelihood is that you're probably going to get re-traumatized, right? If you believe I'm not safe in the world or bad things happen to me, in a sense, you're kind of attracting those people, places, and things that are going to mirror back to you the truth of your experience. And this is why, you know, when I work with folks who have PTSD, it's typically chronic a recurrent PTSD, complex PTSD, meaning many, many different experiences have happened to them over and over again. It's, it's an established, you know, fact that if you experience childhood abuse, you're much more likely as an adult to choose, let's say, partners in romantic relationships who are going to be abusive to you because on some level you expect that or you think this is the way it is, this is normal, this is what I deserve. So self-esteem tends to be low, a sense of empowerment tends to be low, especially if you're functioning from that victim consciousness. And oftentimes there's a big sense of shame, um, like this sense I'm broken, I'm defective, I'm damaged goods, um, and a real sense of like, like a lack of self-worth. Okay, so this is kind of the picture of, of trauma. And obviously there's a lot more to it. I think we have a great page, um, you know, on the Firebird website. Firebird is my trauma healing center. And um, at Firebird, uh, I have a, a lot of um, special, we have a lot of specialty around treating trauma, but we have a page on there saying what is trauma. And we can put that in the comments link because I think that, I, it goes into more depth around the symptoms and the impact that trauma can have on us in all those different physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual ways. So that to me is, is really the, in a nutshell, what's going on with trauma. And then what do we do about it? Well, we have lots of healing modalities. That's the good news. We have um, things from Western medicine and mental health, psychiatry, psychology, and we have a lot of holistic, more holistic approaches coming from Eastern or more traditional healing methods from all over the world. Um, energy healing, energy medicine, energy psychology is one I really uh, love using. Um, Hands-on energy work has been being done for over 50,000 years or more as far back as you know we, we can see it being recorded. Um, Hands-on healing, uh, other modalities like tapping EFT, where we're tapping or you or acupuncture, where we're stimulating acupuncture points, those techniques are really helpful. Now, what, what the science is telling us is that when we activate those acupuncture points on our body, it actually sends a deactivating signal up to the amygdala and pulls us out of that fight, flight, freeze response and gets our nervous system calmed down. 
We also have breathing techniques. You know, I, I list a lot of these uh, on the, if you sub, if subscribe to the mailing list on the Firebird website, you can get five free videos that I did on calming your nervous system down. There's some breathing ones. There's an introduction to EFT tapping. Uh, I also have other videos on YouTube. So, uh, and, and there's a ton of resources out there. So, you know, from ancient Indian uh, medicine, acupuncture comes from Chinese medicine. From ancient Indian medicine, we have yoga. We have specific breathing techniques. You know, they also were very skilled in um, helping people to recover uh, from traumatic experiences. We have um, homeopathy. Um, we have herbs. We have so many different calming, you know, kava kava that they use. It came from, from the Pacific Islands, you know, and they use kava kava to help people calm down. So there's so many different uh, traditional healing modalities. And, uh, you know, more recently, we've had a lot coming out in the more somatic realm. Um, people, again, like Peter Levine, he developed something called somatic experiencing. There's another modality called Hakomi. There's um, sensory motor therapy. Uh, Pat Ogden, who was a colleague of Peter Levine's, I saw them years ago when I was in massage school in Boulder. This would have been like 1995 or six, I remember going to a conference with those two and learning all about how trauma gets stored in the body and how we how they have developed these different modalities that are more sort of body based to help people release that traumatic energy that's stuck in the body. Um, EMDR, Francine Shapiro's work, you know, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is very interesting. It involves different eye movements and sort of left brain, right brain stimulation. Um, and there's something about that as somebody remembers the traumatic event that the doing the eye movements and the left brain, right brain stuff somehow allows us, you know, to release uh, the trauma that's been locked into the body um, from EMDR brain spotting emerge. That's one that I'm trained in and that we have all our therapists at the rehab that I work at um, trained in. That one also involves the eye movements and bilateral sound. So music that's kind of stimulating the inner ear. We now know from polyvagal theory, that's a whole nother conversation. At some point I'll maybe do another um, Facebook live on polyvagal theory because that's a whole thing in and of itself. But ever since that came out, Stephen Porges's work, we now know a lot more about the nervous system and, and how um, the vagus nerve that runs through our whole body is involved in the fight, flight, freeze response. So he has developed some interesting methods with um, the inner ear to uh, help calm the nervous system down. Um, when I interviewed on the podcast, I had this woman, Jody Cohen, come on and she works with essential oils. And she showed us how we can use essential oils on these um, points on the back of the ear, interestingly enough, where often women put perfume on. Um, and that will also uh, activate that vagus nerve to get out of uh, arousal and into a calmer, relaxed state. So, so many different modalities. NET, I have spoken on that before um, in this format. And neuroemotional technique, I really like that one a lot because, again, developed by a chiropractor, Dr. Scott Walker. We had him on the podcast at one time talking about it as well. Um, <clears throat> working with, again, emotions and things that are stuck in the body that we might not consciously even be aware of. And we have ways. So the nice thing that I like about a lot of these tools, especially the more energy-based ones, um, is that we don't have to necessarily even think about or like have a cognitive understanding of the experience, we can access those energies just through the body or in some other energetic kind of way. And then you have uh, access consciousness. We can do a lot of clearing verbally with the clearing statement, and then we can do hands-on energy work. Um, access bars is wonderful um, for helping people who have had maybe traumas that are locked in the body. Other body processes we have as well, where we can put hands on the body and invite the body, run a particular energy through the body that it will allow it to release these traumatic energies. Because one of the things that happens is you essentially get stuck on a loop, right? I mean, that's kind of what the flashbacks are. It's like a broken record where the same scenario keeps playing out in your mind over and over and over again. And, and this kind of hands-on energy work can break that pattern and allow you to release that energy that's keeping you stuck on a loop. So, I mean, so many different modalities. 
Um, you know, th there certainly is from traditional Western psychiatry um, or psychology, uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. <clears throat> I know that some people have used it for, um, for working with traumatic experiences. I think it's good to do that work later. I think it's harder to use CBT in the moment, especially if you're having a panic attack or you're having that fight, flight, freeze response because this part of your brain isn't super activated and it's hard to get back into your logical thinking brain when your more primitive lizard brain has hijacked it and is telling you you're being chased down by lions tigers and bears it's sort of hard to rationalize your way out of that but i do think cbt is valuable and looking at like the core beliefs that maybe came from it or the meaning and significance um, you gave to the traumatic experiences or you know like the victim mentality i talked about CBT is also helpful for looking at thought distortions. So as a result of experiencing painful or traumatic things, you might see yourself in the world differently in a more distorted way. So that kind of work also is valuable. Um, but I also think we need a giant toolbox. We need different tools for different situations. No one tool is going to work for every scenario that you have in your life. So I like to have a giant toolbox and I'm always adding more. So that's my, in a nutshell, uh, what is really going on with trauma. The good news is we can heal from it. It's not something that you have to be stuck with for the rest of your life, but it may take some work. So my suggestion is learn your own emotional coping skills, self-regulation skills, breathing, tapping, things like that. Um, be set free fast is another one I love for things like that. Get some tools for yourself. But if you have deeper trauma, if you have complex trauma, if you have childhood trauma, um, you know, and, and you may need to do some inner child work and you might need to do some things that it's safer to do with a trained practitioner. I don't often suggest, even myself, when I first started learning energy psychology and using it on myself, I got myself overwhelmed and flooded. I, it would have been better for me to be working with someone at that time, a, you know, like a mental health professional. So you know, I think it's valuable work and there is a lot you can do on your own. And sometimes you need some guidance and support from somebody who's really trained in these modalities who can help you. But there is hope. You can heal. Um, the whole, you know, symbolism of firebird healing, the phoenix bird rising from the ashes. To me, that is a representation of how we can soar and we can be free of our traumas, um, even if it feels like at one point in time, you know, maybe it was going to destroy us. You can have that sense when you're experiencing traumatic things that it feels like it's destroyed you, but it doesn't have to. Um, we have the tools, we have the techniques, we have the support, we have the ability to heal. Um, and I'm living proof of that. So, and as are the hundreds or even at this point, thousands of clients that I've worked with over the last 25 years. So if you want to find out more, um, I would definitely invite you to check out our website, Firebird Healing. We give a ton of resources articles, um, articles other people have written, our own articles. I'm publishing a lot on this topic these days. My book also is a great resource, um, especially for challenging the limiting or core false beliefs that come from experiences that are traumatic. Um, there's, there's just a ton of resources out there. So thanks for tuning in today. Um, Dr. A signing off, and I'll see you next time on Ask Dr. Adriana.